lots of chase things there. Good stuff. So well, this has been a day of metaphysics. You know, we start with start off with trust, and then Jason in this session really explaining some of the metaphysics. So you can start to see why it seems to be like a difficult thing, because when the mind is so powerful, it believes in the ego. It, the ego seems to use that power, and until you withdraw your mind completely from the ego, then the world will reflect your own doubt. So if you think you have friends and relatives that are trying to slow your spiritual journey down, it's because the friends and relatives are acting out the, the ego belief, the still the doubt about identity. So nobody in the world is slowing anybody down. There's nothing in the world, there's really no world out there that can slow you down. If you think you have a, an angry boss, uh, it's just coming from the ego's anger that you still are invested in. If you feel you have angry parents or children, or you have problems with authority figures, lawyers, police officers, government officials, yeah, yeah it, the whole, <laughs> it's all the authority problem of still believing that you can make up an identity different from God's, and that's what's getting played out in the world. But it never has anything to do with what's happening on the screen. The authority issue is still trying to believe in a thought system that God did not create. And that's where all the specialness, you know, you heard all the conditioning. You're special, you're very special. You know, that's the whole idea, instead of just being one, the ego says, oh, you can do better than oneness. Uh, you can be unique. You can be your own unique, individual, special person. And that's what the ego is using as a lure to say, you've got something valuable now. It's your own individuality, but it's still part of a lie. <laughs> Sorry to put a damper on individuality. <laughs> Instead of an individual, you are indivisible. Think of that word, indivisible. Yeah, that sounds more. Yes, sounds more restful. Yes. So this is the metaphysics, and then now it comes down to transfer of training, to practicing as you go through your daily life, and that's what we'll work on. Uh, the rest of the week. Then that way, in these sessions that we have, you can you can raise whatever the issues are, whether they're financial issues. You could see in the movie that the whole thing was based, driven by finances. You know, all the lies were driven by greed. It was underneath it. If you have financial issues, if you have relationship issues, if you have health issues, you start to see from this movie and what we're talking about that, that health is inner peace and that any kind of searching outside of yourself for your identity is what sickness is. And the body just seems to break down and grow old and die only because it's being misused by the mind. Not that there's any value in having a body live extra years, because it's just a learning device. So it's just useful until you get the ultimate lesson that, that you are one, you have a unified consciousness. And once you begin to see and have a realization that you are unified consciousness or forgiven, you can perceive the forgiven world, then at that point the body's use is about over. Uh, there's no more need. Now, Jesus didn't, leave, didn't have to live to be 80 or 90 years old. About 30, 35, 36 years was, was plenty. And uh, it wasn't a problem to let it go. But uh, as people think that Jesus just let the body go, but he let the whole cosmos go. And so, we could say he, he woke up and now he's speaking to us, continuously reminding us that we have the, of course the power, we have, it's inevitable that we will do the same thing that the way shower did, because uh, who we are is not to be limited to form. We are, we are light. In the end, all the clones were kind of opened up to the light, which is a good symbol of bringing all those thoughts of separation back to the light. 
You, you have to do it that way. You have to bring the dark thoughts in your mind to the light of truth. You can't bring God into this world. All of the churches and the mosques and the synagogues and the ashrams, uh, all of the attempts at statues, uh, holy river, holy water, you know, sacred shrines, you know, all of this is an attempt to bring God into this world. And it can't be done. Uh, this world was made as an attack on God, a place where God could not enter. And therefore, you have to literally give up the world in order to remember yourself as, as you were created by God. So, those are strong, strong metaphysics, but that's just giving it to you straight, you know. I think everybody here is, is kind of ready for it. Give it to me straight. Give me, the, give me my whiskey straight up. <laughs> Don't put it on the rocks I'm anymore. <laughs> Annie, Annie says she chokes a bit on the whiskey sometimes. <laughs> but you've got a smile on your face. You, you're taking a big swing now. <laughs> Take the worm down too. <laughs> yeah. It's better to, to, to get it straight, because that just helps end the delay. You know, the ego just wants to constantly delay the inevitable. And it's always trying to come up with more tricks and more schemes and more designs to trick the mind to stay sleeping. David, could you help me understand the cosmos, the past, the devil? <coughs> yeah, 2,000 years ago, Jeshua said some pretty powerful words. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. I am calling you out of the world. Uh, he had twelve apostles, and um, basically <clears throat> he tried to he had to teach it in parables, but uh, he used parable of the prodigal son, meaning that even though you seem to squander your inheritance, which is divine light and spirit, uh, you always be welcome back. God is the God of love, not anger. Uh, you will be no matter how you squandered it all, it doesn't matter. You'll be welcome back. And the father rushed to meet the the prodigal son and. Had a celebration, so he used a lot of parables. Uh, he, Jesus, knew that this world was a dream, and in fact, uh, some of you might have read uh, some of the bit of the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, um, basically, Jesus told Thomas, uh, I'll t "I'm going to tell you something, but don't tell anybody else, because if you tell anybody else, it will bring fire down on our heads." <laughs> And basically it was that this world was a dream. Uh, but but 2,000 years ago, the, the, you know, the people in Galilee were not really ready <laughs> to hear that the whole world was a dream. And now, to <coughs> this day, we have books coming out like The Disappearance of the Universe, uh, which are just beginning to say the same thing. And A Course in Miracles is saying the same thing, but it's, it's really getting clear of the metaphysics so that you don't try to glorify the world, but really more so that you don't try to, not only don't try to glorify it, but don't try to label it as negative either. It's actually neutral. And we were talking <coughs> earlier today about it's, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. When you clear your mind of judgment, which is what Jesus taught, you know, in the Beatitudes, you know, judge not lest ye be judged. He was saying, if you clear your mind of judgment, you know, and you purify your heart, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. And to the extent that you judge, it will be you will be judging yourself. And you cannot know God and know yourself as God created you as long as you persist on attempting an impossible thing, which is judgment. So in the end, it's not the message is not stop judging. It's just come to the recognition that you never had the capability. You were never created as a judge. You know, you never had the ability. The judgment was just an ego device that was invented by the ego to bring control and order to a chaotic universe. And it seems to bring somewhat order, even though it never satisfies. You know, we have prison systems, we have laws, we have lawyers, and we have militaries and everything, and all to bring order into a chaotic situation, but the clones are not going to bring about any true sense of divine order, which is just coming about through forgiveness. So really, Jesus' message is the same 2,000 years ago and now, it's just forgive the illusion, release the illusion from your mind. <coughs> She wrote me 
what she said that if you know this is a dream and and you're happy to to release the world, she said then you can have fun and live a happy dream. Mm-hmm. But is there something that we can do and still be in this world but not be of it? Still enjoy it and interact and I mean obviously you do. Yeah, it's, that's the whole goal, is to to be aware that it's a dream. And I even have a, my movie watcher's guide for enlightenment. There's a movie uh, that Bill Murray did. Um, what's the name of it? Um, Groundhog. Groundhog. The man who knew too little. Oh yeah. Um, basically, in, in that movie, he basically <coughs> sees the whole world as an interactive theater called the Theater of Life, where the characters come. And so they try to kidnap him, poison him, uh, they try to strangle him, they do all kinds of things you know, to him. But he's, in his mind, he has a mindset that it's all just play acting, it's all theater. So one of the early scenes is uh, two young people come up, maybe in their 20s or whatever, to rob him. They, they got him at knife point and he's suddenly in the middle of the, of the robbery, they ask for his wallet, he suddenly clicks in and, rem- and remembers, oh yeah, this is this is all theater. So he says to him, you know, let's do it again, let's do the scene again. <laughs> and they're so shocked. <laughs> they, they thought they had him fearful at knife point, and then he remembers, oh, it's just theater. So he goes through the whole movie, uh, and they can't touch him. He just laughs his way through the entire movie, even though uh, it seems like the world through the ego's lens, it would be like serious threats. They think he's some kind of a super agent, uh, greater than James Bond or something, because he's so fearless. But he's fearless because he has in mind that it's just theater. So you can imagine some of the biggest scenes, you know, your, your partner walks out, or your mother or father dies or something, and you kind of whack the body in the cast and go, oh, great job! Oh, that's the best death scene I've seen. Oh, yeah. 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 Or, that's right. or the, the partner walks out, leaves like a note, I'm leaving you, goodbye, I never want to see you again. Yeah. Bravo! Oh, what a separation scene! <laughs> You're just sued for, for you're sued for a million dollars, and the lawyer gets off the phone. Oh, bravo! Good job <laughs> to your whole your whole staff. Tell it's just been marvelous. You know, if you if, if you really <laughs> knew that it was a dream, uh, you really would have a really good time because it's like when you have a nightmare at night time, and when you wake up from the nightmare, you may still have a little after effect of what was going on in the dream. But usually then it's just, it only takes a matter of seconds before you go, whew, you just have a, a deep sigh of relief going, thank God that was a dream. Because it just seems so real moments before when you were dreaming it, as if you were right there in the situation and it was really happening to you. But then when you realize that it's a dream, then it's like no harm done. You know, you could be right there in the guillotine, uh, but wake up, you could be there like Joan of Arc, burning at the stake, and whew, whew, well, I was sweating, I was kind of hot there for a moment, but it was just a dream. So, yeah, what your friend was saying, it's the whole idea is to see that it's a dream. And you do that by getting into your purpose. Like I was sharing earlier this morning, when the more you're in your purpose, the more it does take on like a fairy tale, dreamlike quality. It does start to seem surreal. You probably have had glimpses moments and glimpses where it just started seeing very surreal and light-hearted. Uh, sometimes children, you know, they, they just don't know the seriousness of things because there really is no seriousness. They're very <laughs> light-hearted, you know, they, they're reflecting that innocence of, of not taking it too serious. And so, Isn't that what Jay just said in the New Testament when he said, it, except you become a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And they're very dependent on parents, little children, but he says in the Course, likewise be dependent on the Holy Spirit. You know, imagine becoming so dependent on the Holy Spirit. Dependency has a bad uh, rap in this world. You know, nobody wants to be dependent. You know, that's like weak and, you know, it's terrible. But actually, if you can become dependent on your internal guide, on your intuition, 
that's the ultimate source of uh, strength, of total invulnerability. So, you know, it's like, uh, I used to, a friend of mine, Resta, she liked the, the Pinocchio analogy of Pinocchio getting off the strings and wanting to be a real boy, an independent, autonomous, real boy. And so her prayer after she heard that metaphor that I gave on Pinocchio was, please get me back on the strings, and please Holy Spirit, <laughs> you'll be at the crossbow, you know, you, you pull, move the puppet. Uh, and that's really what we mean by getting into purpose. You know, you smile more frequently, you laugh a lot, you hug, you, you use kind words of, it's going to be okay, everything's going to work out, you know, this, you let the Spirit just pour through you, and use the body to free the mind. Uh, just like in this movie, they had to kind of bring them together, instead of like meeting your Maker, which is finally waking up and realizing God. First you, you have to get in touch with the thoughts that you think, and the beliefs that you're holding on to. And as long as you stay distracted with the world, and, and are concerned with survival issues, and the body issues, then that's just a, a way of delaying getting in touch with the, the underlying beliefs. So, you, you know, when you look at history even, if you look at the ancient Greeks, you know, they, if you really look at some of the writings of Plato, you find a lot of stuff that Jesus taught was in line with Plato, you find a lot of stuff in the Course that's in line with Plato, and the Greeks were, you know, centuries and centuries before Jesus, but if you stop a moment and you took, look at their lifestyle, you know, they basically uh, laid around in the bathtub uh, all day, all day long. Well, the Romans next door were trying to conquer the world, you know, and conquest Roman Empire and everything. The Greeks were like, no, we're not working. We're not doing all that work uh, to try to conquer the world. We got to figure out what the world's for first, and then once we find out the purpose, we'll take some action. So they were getting into looking at. Uh, I think Plato was one of them. Was saying, you ponder things like, if there were no red objects in the world would the concept red exist? Well, this is the kind of stuff they thought about. What is the nature of existence? You know, they weren't interested in conquering the world. They were interested, they were existing, they wanted to free their mind, you know, so, so likewise, you know, uh, while you guys had that session this afternoon with Jason, I was out in the hot tub. Uh, that's right, that's where I was. <laughs> and people have said, you know, what should we do and everything, and that's why I say, well, there's a couple things. In this world, it still strikes me how everybody has to own separate everything. You know, people have their own houses, their own cars, their own silverware, you know, everything is owned. And it's like, there's so much effort doing meaningless things and working to own these things, instead of sharing. And so, that would be the first thing I would suggest, in a practical way, <laughs> is share. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's start to learn how to share. And the second thing is is some of those things intuitively you feel like yeah it would be nice to stay in bed some days. It would be nice to take long siestas or to take long soaks in the bathtub or the hot tub. Uh, I was mentioned going out to the hot tub today, and, and uh, Sarita was saying, oh why don't you do a uh, have a hot tub lunch session out there. I said, yeah, I was thinking about that when I was out there. He's like a nice little shelf. But I mean, that's, I have a friend who, who this past year ran for Congress in the United States, and uh, he's very progressive. He's into the Course in Miracles and Krishnamurti, and uh, he's actually running for Congress. And he said, one of his ideas was, he, was, he found all of those houses, uh, the Senate and the House of Representatives should eat, every congressperson should have a hot tub. In fact, one giant hot tub, so everybody could <laughs> sit around and soak and relax a bit and talk things through instead of getting and voting and, and getting into all these struggles. And to me, that's a practical idea. You know, I think that would be money well spent. In fact, Jason, we have a hot tub at the Peace House, and he one time said it's the best well spent money <laughs> that we've ever used there. <laughs> Get a hot tub. But it's part of this. That's our theme for tomorrow: is rest. Practice resting your mind. Practice giving yourself, you know, nurturing yourself, pampering your mind, and and it's very valuable. I mean, I used to 
when I would meditate or have heart-to-heart -heart talks, I would, I would think, wow, this is fantastic, I wish I could do more of it, but I have to, you know, work and handle all these other things. And, but the more I began to, you know, give attention and care to my mind, and pay less attention to the world and the body, then the more happy and joyful I got. So I thought, I'm going to keep this up. So I've kind of gone to the extreme now, where, you know, we came back from a seven months tour one time and we had, we had trees growing in our gutter. Uh, we're about a, a meter high. Uh, that's, that's not putting too, too much care uh, to the body of the house. <laughs> and uh, so it's the same with a lot of mystics and saints. They didn't care too much. The insignificance of the body must become an acceptable idea as you begin to awaken. So that's in line with that dream thing. If the body is just part of a, a dream and it doesn't have any reality, it can't be your home. Uh, it must be that we really do have a home in spirit or in the kingdom of heaven. So then you can start to take a few deep breaths like, okay, then uh, the age of the body or the, the longevity of the body is not uh, the central issue, you know, it's just a learning device that is used by the mind for a time while it's forgiving, and then the body and the world just get gently laid aside, just like you take a sweater off. Uh, if you weren't cool anymore, it's like, okay, it served its purpose, no big deal. So it's good news. So, hope you enjoyed our metaphysical day. And I think uh, that movie may be in your dreams tonight. You might see Renovatio, <laughs> rebirth, rebirth. And then uh, tomorrow we will talk about rest, tomorrow morning, after you've had a rest. <laughs> and uh, we'll get into practical application. So, be sure you, if you get any questions that start coming to mind, write them down. And we'll go right at them. Thank you.